Hi there. Welcome to our next presentation of the Sound Healing Conference. Today we have Lisa Rafael, who has been teaching at the Institute for about forever. <laughs> One of our favorite instructors. Lisa Rafael is an expert teacher in vocal sound healing and energy healing. She's an award-winning book uh, uh, a book or art author clinically with clinically tested music uh, uh, oh her award winning book clinically tested music safe in the arms of love promoting best birthing with Gary Malkin and David Sarenda PhD she's a playwright multiple has multiple healing recordings and is a creator of five worlds teaching now is the time song video about the pollution crisis her website is lisarafel.com. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. What have you been up to lately? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you. Uh, actually, uh, it's been a very busy time, even though we're all sheltering in place. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it gives an enormously um, rich opportunity for knowing yourself and for coming into a place inside of yourself to realize how much noise there is um, because our distractions are so much less and our ability to, um, to distract ourselves are so much greater. You know, <laughs> you, can, <laughs> you, can, you, you, you get to know yourself pretty well. And if you have a partner, uh, certainly you get to know them a lot better too. So I think it's been a scary and important time for everyone. And for me, um, I've been delving much more deeply into my creative work. Uh, I have a new um, song and video that's just been released called Now is the Time. And uh, I recorded it with two Grammy winners, Lily Hayden and Itai Disraeli. And uh, it's spectacular and it addresses the pollution crisis. But what it does really is it goes to the heart of what our children are going to have to face. And, um, and I think probably all of my work, you know, I've loved teaching for you guys. I just love it. The quality of your students and uh, the enthusiasm for wanting a better world is palpable in all of your students. And uh, it, it thrills me to be able to teach them. And for myself, uh, I'm also learning for myself during this time. Uh, I'm working on a musical play uh, with Gary Malkin, oh, cool. uh, which is very cool, and it's about birth. And, um, and I'm doing a lot of other writing. I'm doing um, interesting spoken word and poetry and, and listening to a lot of different sounds. So... Um, that's what I've been up to. Unfortunately, my brother and sister-in-law lost their house in the mm. fire last week. Mm. And uh, that brought it home in a very powerful way, mm -hmm. what it is for someone to lose everything. Mm. I, I have lost things in a fire before, in the Malibu fire, but I didn't lose everything. And my brother and sister-in-law lost everything. Uh, wow. So um, that, of course, awakens what is rebirth mm. and and what is mourning and what is grief mm. and um you know what is empathy and compassion and and renewal mm. you know mm. so those are the themes going on i think universally mm -hmm. as well as in our house and uh that's what i've been up to how are you great Do, just doing great i mean it's really uh it's really an amazing time. A lot of things are coming together right now. I've got one big question for you. Um, if you had all the money in the world, what would you do with sound to help the planet? Or just uh, overall, what would you do to help people on the planet? Well, I would do two things. The first thing I would do is buy up all the land, all of it, to make sure it was treated right and it was cared for, mm. and that the women were the caretakers, mm. and that it was used sustainably and uh, beautifully kept in raw areas, and that there was a balance between usage and non-usage, mm. and that there is a, um, 
there is a respect and caring for the land that is given through the heart. Mm -hmm. So you really are kind and grateful for what you have been given. Nice. And uh, then I would work with singing all mm -hmm. over the world mm -hmm. to really help bring the songs of all the different cultures mm -hmm. to each other. So we could all hear the music of, of, of civilization and what that can do for us in terms of knowing each other and in terms of being grateful to each other for, for what it is that we each have. You know, um, if there was a third thing I was going to do, uh, it would be to bring sound and music into school children from the very beginning and give uh, the opportunity for um, individuals to learn what it is to feel rhythm internally and to be able to resonate with each other. Cool. So those cool. would be my, my projects. You want to give me money? I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> you never know these days. A lot of things are changing. You well, know, you something happens like that. Let's go for it, you know? Yeah, we have a lot of philanthropists that are helping uh, uh, fund just about everything we're doing, including the Sound Education Center that, uh, you know, with all the, uh, the uh, 2,500 exercises we've done for the children. So uh, maybe we can definitely join together on that. Very cool. Very cool. So um, you're going to do some sound for us, a little ceremony? Well, um, if, I'm, if I was doing a ceremony, um, hmm, you didn't ask about ceremony, so I don't have my okay. sage and my okay. things with me, but here's what I would do. Oh, cool. So uh, when I start, all, all my classes begin with ceremony. Uh -huh. So um, th those are my classes, not the ones I teach for you. Uh -huh. But I could do it for you. We could talk about that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but what I do is I have people have their own feather, their own sage because uh, we're working all online. Um, I sage them as well as myself. And as you know, David, energy is not local. Um, it is non-local. So when I'm working psychically or with sound or with sage or any part of a ceremony, uh, it travels through to the person who is on the other side of this astounding device that lets us all talk to each other. So um, I would begin with that. Okay. I would begin with, with the four w directions as I was taught. And I do this in your class. I do begin with the four directions as I was taught by Jaime Ho Storm, which is um, a different kind of four directions. It's a mixture of Mayan and Crow. And I call in the elements and I invite in the ancestors. I invite in, I invite in the energies, the healing spirits, so that we're in a sacred space of relationship so that when I make the sounds and the sounds are are given as prayers when I make these sounds um, they're amplified through that sacred field uh, in a way and in fact I'll, I'll talk about this later how sound can spread and how sound can be contained through the sacred um, containers and what my experience with that has been cool so, um, so I would call in the four directions, which I can do right now, which is the east, which is Chima, which is the sun, the ability to see new beginnings, the experience of the eagle having the farthest vision. It's the, the awakening each day. And then I would call in Morila, who is uh, the water and our capacity to transform through plants through photosynthesis, through emotion, and through our ability to understand how close emotion is to our body. And then to the west, to Ihama, which is the, uh, the element of the earth, of our bones and our body, of our capacity to uh, go inside, to feel intr introspection and our intuition to trust in nothing, which is the beginning of something, to trust in the womb of the dark, which is where all life begins, and to allow that bear in us to rest, to sleep, to dream. And then to the north, to Wehoma, to white buffalo calf woman, to the buffalo, to our lungs, to our air, 
to our ability to uh, feel through air, our breath, our own ideas. You know, we say take a breath to get new ideas, to relate to ourselves as uh, a part of this ecosystem um, and to all the animal kingdoms and, and to be in deep connection, deep connection to this experience. And then the number five, which is the us in the center of this circle is um, it's the profound gift that we are given at birth which is the ability to recognize beauty and the ability to have choice. And this is our birthright. So when we think of our life from that perspective, knowing that we can recognize beauty and what a gift that is, and that we have the choice to do that in any circumstance, no matter what the circumstance is, we could find beauty. I mean, when you really think about the extraordinary, I mean, that is, that is amazing as our birthright. So I've called all that in and I will choose a prayer. And the prayer I think today is for connection. It's to allow um, this very divided world to remember how important we all are through our children and the future generations, that we must care for each other in order for them to survive. And we're at a critical time in our globe's history. If we don't take care of each other, it's quite possible they won't survive. So we need to take care of the earth, take care of the air, the water, the ground, the the weather, but we need to take care of each other's intentions, how we think about each other, what we say to each other, how we receive each other, how we treat each other with kindness and respect. So that is my prayer, and I will sing to that. I also light a candle just so you know, there is a candle here.
May all beings be safe. May all beings be in peace. May all be beings feel love. May all beings, may all beings, may all beings care for each other. Is there a prayer you would like me to do? Mm. Mm. How about one of compassion? Ah. Okay. I will, I will, I will. 
Thank you. Thank you for asking. Yeah. It's something I, um, I first learned to do in Egypt. And um, I have a large, wonderful, wonderful statue of Toth right here on my desk. And um, when I was in Egypt, I, I was when I first learned 
about the energies of all the gods and goddesses and began these meditations with the different statues. Uh, in particular, the Sekhmet that is in the small Sekhmet temple in Luxor, whose eyes will follow you everywhere. And when I first had that first experience with her, I began to understand that I wasn't looking at a statue at all. Um, I was looking at like a person, the embodiment of someone, um, and you get to see their soul when they show it to you. And um, these gods and goddesses, when you interact with them through a statue, often the statue will change shape or will follow you with their eyes to, to help guide you. And I looked over at Toth right after I did this prayer. And he doesn't normally have a smile on his face. <laughs> but there was definitely a smile on his face looking at me. He looks so much happier since those prayers. So, um, so I'm, I'm kind of, I've never done them from my desk before. So I've never had him be the beneficiary so directly before. So <laughs> that was kind of, that's really sweet. Yeah, it was when I was in Egypt and I first started doing these spontaneous prayers in the different temples. Mm -hmm. And uh, the temple of Hathor, um, you know, Dendera, was an extraordinary powerful experience because we got to go into the crypts and really see the designs of the electromagnetic fields that they were working with at the time. Mm -hmm. And then do ceremony and climb... Um, through in ceremony, through from the crypt up to the birthing house, wow. and then up to the astrological ceiling. Wow. And so we did this when I was leading trips to Egypt. But just to go back, my first experience, which was so profound, was on someone else's journey. And um, I had been preparing for that trip for months because I had been given um, this notice that if I was able to uh, do this trip properly, it would close the book on the first part of my life and the whole second part of my life would open. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I had to be at the Great Pyramid on the winter solstice of the new moon, um, of, the, of the new moon um, at midnight and not get myself there. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was the deal. I could not manipulate anything to get myself there. But if I was there and if I chanted at that place, um, my life would dramatically change. And the first place that I found, the, and, and on the boat that we were on, as these people were sharing, it was an IONS, uh, Institute for Noetics Sciences tour. And this one man was saying, you know, I have this feeling, it was out of the blue. He said, well, I have this feeling if we make sounds that the energy of the of the wisdom of the ages will come out of the sand. Mm -hmm. And I, I started sweating all over because for two months I had been preparing sounds to do just that. Mm -hmm. And so I stood up in front of this group. I said, well, I'm going to be making sounds. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to join me, you're more than welcome. And if you want me to teach you, let's go up at sunrise at the top of the deck of the boat and I'll teach you. Um, and that's how my sound journey became manifest um, and it was um, in, um, in the temple to um, to Horus mm -hmm. that there is a, an altar and behind the altar is a wall and I got called behind that wall to put my head up against the wall and to make this sound mm -hmm. and um, everybody from the temple came and they sort of put their head against the wall with me. Mm. And then everyone dispersed and this uh, remarkable guide. At that time, uh, this was before 9-11, this was when everything was open, I could spend the night in the Great Pyramid, you know, it was, um, it was a really beautiful time. Uh, a guide came, a guard, you know, came over to me and he said, follow me. And um, I followed him. And this other guard came over and he said, 
give me your things, which was a purse and a camera and my, all my stuff. And I just gave it to him. <laughs> and this first guard led me to a hole in the wall. And he put a chair in front and he said, climb in. And so he led me down this narrow passage inside the wall wow. and then down all these steps to this place where the statues had been stored because there were all these, um, you know, cutouts in the wall for where the statues had been stored. And he said, sing. And so I started uh, my chanting and um, after a few moments, he said, stop. And then he gave me a way to sing uh, Isis. And I started singing that. And I swear to you, honestly, I could see the manifestation of the statues in the wall. Mm -hmm. I could see what they were. Mm -hmm. You know, so my relationship, I, I led three trips to Egypt, four, four altogether to Egypt for a different peace trips and sacred trips to all over. It's had a profound impact on me to uh, be able to use sound through that extraordinary country. When I was at the Temple of Horus, when I walked onto the grounds, I immediately went into the body of a priest and started toning. And the sound I was making, I knew was my home note. Mm. And I, I found the place where I used to sit in the, in the, uh, uh, the open area. And I found the room that I used to sleep in. And it was an amazing experience. Then went back two days later, and the exact same thing happened again. Ah, oh, fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. Yeah, that's right. I, I had that experience in Greece uh -huh. um, on the Isle of Rhodes. There's, uh -huh. um, a, there's a, a ruin called Camaros, and mm -hmm. I, was, I was just walking through, and I went, oh, that's my house. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And I walked inside, and, you know, that was, that was my house. I, <laughs> I had that happen also as a priestess at the, at the Tholos at, um, 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 what's it called, where the Temple of Apollo is, um, in the mountains mm -hmm. with the oracle Delphi, in the mm -hmm. Temple of, at Delphi. Mm -hmm. I had that happen to me. Ah. I didn't have it happen in Egypt. I, I felt all this familiarity, mm -hmm. like I knew where I was going and I knew what I was feeling. But I didn't ever feel like I walked into my home. Although, when we went to uh, the home of Akhenaten, mm -hmm. um, I actually, I don't know exactly what I felt. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was home or a priestess or, I didn't have time because I was leading the trip mm -hmm. to really drop in. Mm -hmm. But boy, was that familiar. Mm -hmm. Felt very familiar. There's one other thing I remember you told me once when you were in China and went to the town where, where Quan Yan yes. was, was, apparently was, and you saw the essence of Quan Yan above a house or something? And no, she was in the house. So it's, it was in Hangzhou. So uh -huh. Hangzhou, Hangzhou is a beautiful city. Um, it's, you know, their towns are millions of people. So uh, their, their towns are millions of people. They're, they're not little towns. This is a big city for us, but for them, it's a town. And Hangzhou is gorgeous. It's, um, and it's supposed to be the home of Kuan Yin. So we're in this hotel, and I just decide to meditate. And suddenly this presence, beautiful. Oh my God, what a beautiful presence. She was like 20 feet tall, but like the ceiling of the room expanded to hold mm -hmm. her. So it was like there was no ceiling in the room. It was like the ceiling of the room disappeared and, and she was just there. It was beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. cool. Cool. Yeah, when we were down, uh, when, the first trip that I led to Egypt, we were able to go into the pit, you mm -hmm. know, um, and we did meditation down there as a group. It was a small group of 10. And everyone had the same experience, wow. which was the ceiling lifted off and we saw the stars. Mm -hmm. We all had the same experience. Yeah. It was, it was, um, I've had that before where we have like either a unified hallucinogenic experience <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> or we are truly all in this altered space in this zone together. But 
Cool. I've been very fortunate, David. You know, I've traveled to these sacred places during a time in my life when I was really popping open in all my psychic work and all my uh, healing work. And it was like I was, um, I mean, at one point when I came back from Greece, I walked into my house and the transformer outside my house blew up. My TV was going on and off by itself. You know, you go to a computer store and it would say abort, you know? <laughs> so, you know, the lights, I know a lot of people have lights going on and off. Um, but it, the power of that actually brings me to, uh, as we're talking about this, it brings me to uh, the beginning of what I began to understand about boundary. Perfect. You know, um, your presentation for today. Yeah, I was I was out of my body, so I didn't understand boundary while these experiences were happening, and while they were happening, it was fine. I was in altered time and space. You know, one day you and I can sit down. I have a lot of altered time space stories <laughs> that are just amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it it taught me how mutable time and space is. It gave me uh, a true recognition that we are co-creating our realities and that with the intention and the alignment energetically, it's quite possible to, um, to do things that don't seem possible. And, and being given all those experiences, particularly a very dramatic experience in Greece, very dramatic in Egypt, very dramatic in Tibet. Um, you know, these, uh, and Nepal, these, these abilities to recognize that I am only a part of a very large world that I will never know, but I might get glimpses into if I stay present and in consciousness. And so I like to call it, I go to the file cabinets in the sky <laughs> because there's a lot of them. And, um, and I think all those experiences, number one, told me not to be afraid. Number two, told me that it was possible. And number three, gave me um, um, enough practice, physical practice, that I needed to understand how do I ground, how do I become... Uh, a master in boundary because otherwise I could be, I could, you know, it could be a disaster. Mm -hmm. And, um, and there are so many people who are wounded from the time that they are born um, and before they are born in terms of invasion of not being seen, of not being recognized and not knowing what a boundary is mm -hmm. of parents that blend with them, that project onto them, that don't acknowledge them, that those boundary issues start uh, from very young. Cool. Well, tell us more. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you know, you know, um, there are different ways of healing, and um, and over over time, I have really explored so many different ways of healing, whether it be, I, I began working with stones, not just crystals, but with stones, because when I had my psychic awakening, um, it was, uh, first it started in Nepal, but then in Greece was when I did a ceremony that, uh, by the way, just to let you know, I did do that ceremony um, at the Great Pyramid on the winter solstice of the new moon, and I was taken there it's a wonderful story. Uh, I'm not going to tell it now, but um, it took a lot of patience and waiting and not trying to make it happen and being willing to let it go if it didn't and being willing to trust that if it was meant to be, it would happen. And then it did. And it was extraordinary. And it did change my whole life. So I think that's the valuable lesson we have right now of, of trusting in this relationship to spirit in this time of great unknown. So when I started, I started with stones. I was giving stone layouts. I lived in Malibu. And I somehow knew 
where these stones should go on different people. And they could be rocks and gemstones and non gemstones, all kinds of stones. And I began to see these uh, maps of understanding the energy system through that. And that led me into psychic healing and working with the energy systems of the maps of the different levels of your body. So your mental, emotional, physical, spiritual, etheric bodies. And then being able to see the different layers of that and then working with more body approaches, whether it was Feldenkrais or the Rosen method or different forms of hands-on healing. Uh, uh, learning about tapping, uh, learning about yoga, I learned about NLP, meditation. I, I, um, I felt dr very drawn to shamanism um, at that time when I first started working with the stones and I didn't know much about it. Um, I was visited by a shaman and I discovered that the healing work that I had been doing on others was the work that she had been taught. So I felt very drawn to go to Mongolia and I ended up getting invited to present there at two shaman conferences about my sound and about energy healing. And um, I was so blessed. I, I got off that plane, I kissed the ground. Um, uh, and because Mongolian shamanism is very earth-based and the relationship of the human being between the earth and the sky is we are the tuning fork between the earth and sky. And if you got to Abydos in, um, in Egypt, you could see that the pharaoh is not uh, the, um, not the pharaoh, the uh, Toph is holding a tuning fork, which is connected to the earth. And in Mongolia, that is exactly how they feel. It's, it's called, um, you know, the heavenly sky. And and you are in the world of the heavenly sky there. If you've been to Montana, it's kind of like Montana. You feel high up in the ground, but it's endless sky, endless sky. So um, I learned about shamanism more when I was there um, from the shamans, working with the shamans, being living with the shamans uh, to a degree. And, um, and I realized how much of that was really a part of who I am. I also did a study with Kabbalistic healing, uh, integrative Kabbalistic healing, where again, you're working with the different layers of the spherot inside the body. So you're working multidimensionally again with how do you embody these different dimensionalities that live inside of us. And, you know, in sound healing, I did tuning forks and um, crystal bowls, Tibetan bells, Tibetan bowls, um, Sticks. I love sticks, drumming, uh, by working with binaural beats to a degree. I, I, I studied a little bit of that. Um, I studied with Jill Purse to learn about overtone chanting. And, um, and that made a huge difference. That, that's what I did before I went to Egypt. And that was why I was prepared for the sounds that were going to come out of me in Egypt. So with all of that um, training, uh, and spontaneous learning and intuitive learning. Um, that was how vocal sound healing was born. And it was, it was out of also my teaching about empowerment, self-empowerment and energy healing, that it all, it all kind of came together. And I saw, I saw how the problems arose for people who, who have difficulty holding boundary and, or don't even know it's there or because because they are so permeable, they get confused about what is them and what is not them. And, and in sound healing, that is incredibly uh, possible because sound healing is so permeable. Um, there was about 20 years ago, there was a sound conference, a number of them I went to in New Mexico, uh, put on by the message company. And it was, they were great. There were huge amounts, 500 people would show up. Some people would show up um, having no understanding of boundary. Uh, one man was playing a didgeridoo. He came over and he started blowing it right into me. I went, stop, stop. You're, you didn't ask my permission. And he didn't even realize that that should have been something he should have done. 
I had another one come over trying to put his hands on me. Let me feel this. And I went, no, <laughs> no, you have to ask permission. I have to know what, who you are. Um, and some, some people believe if you just trust spirit and those things happen, you should, you should go with them and flow with them. And I'm not diminishing that experience for those people. I'm simply saying that for me, um, that, that wasn't appropriate because my work was going to be learning about boundary and that was where the beginning stages <clears throat> of my realizing that. <clears throat> so, I'm gonna tell you, uh, there's a ceremony I do, it's called Awaken. And it's where I, I give sound directly to, it's a group. And I give sound directly to the person. I also use my hands. Um, I'm also using my psychic capacity. And I'm helping that person to go to the next level of their development. <clears throat> I've done this for 20 years. When I first, actually maybe longer, ooh. Anyway, when I first started doing this, I learned of the astounding amount of sounds that could come out of my mouth that I had no idea were possible. No idea. And that my throat never was hurt. My body never felt uh, discomfort. Um, I was in this ceremony and I was of service in this ceremony. And so what came out was in great, the best service for that person. And it really taught me about the different sounds. It taught me how they have different results in the body, um, how to listen for the sounds so that I wasn't just making them, I was hearing them. And I was listening for them before they came. Uh, when I was in the Northridge earthquake, uh, when I lived in Los Angeles, I was living in Topanga and the giant quake hit. It was a quake that went up and down and sideways. It was. A, it was so powerful, buildings just fell. And um, I was in Topanga and there was this boom, giant boom. And I go running out of the house and there's a few other women on the street also came running out of the house. The transformer at the top of the hill had, we thought had blown up and uh, this eerie light and you know, <laughs> I was thinking maybe it's a spaceship. They're all thinking maybe it's a spaceship. Nobody really realized it was an earthquake until the aftershock came. And the aftershock, I could hear. I could hear it coming through the rock, like this creaking sound. Almost like a screeching sound of the rock cracking as it was coming toward us in this aftershock. Um, so I began to listen, listen, listen to everything. I started listening to the sound of the trees, listening to the sound of the wind, uh, listening to uh, my breath, uh, listening to how people talk, listening to um, what is there before the sound is made? And how do you listen to silence? How do you use silence as um, a container? So um, this is all informing my work about vocal sound healing. When I use it in class uh, and I teach people how to manipulate really manipulate their boundary, making it further away or closer in, or how do you recognize a large boundary, a small boundary? Uh, people begin to realize not only is this just intention, this is actual reality that other people can feel it. And so I have people walking toward each other where they can feel each other's boundary. They can feel it growing larger. They can feel the intention of making it smaller. I think this work is incredibly important. Um, I've worked a number of times with children who have been deeply wounded from parents 
some of them very well intended. Parents who projected themselves onto their children, so much so they never saw their children. They only saw what they hoped would be their child, fulfilling what they needed. And so that child never actually got seen and the projection was endless. And so that child was just inundated with this um, personality imposed upon them that wanted to control them. And because it started in childhood, um, they had to develop some kind of defense. And so often those children become very psychic, trying to establish safety. So they throw out an etheric boundary to try and understand what's going to come to them. People who have, children who have been abused or who have been um, any form of abuse, violence in terms of language or uh, even energetic, somebody really screaming at them or pit or, or worse. Um, those, those children develop defenses that, um, where they try to help themselves to be safe. They try to avoid how that energy is going to come in. But that doesn't establish a boundary because they have not embodied themselves enough to feel boundary. So when I'm working with sound on a client, my first awareness is I must see that person as sacred. And I have a, David knows, I, um, people, my students know, I have a whole series of protocols uh, that I created for helping people to establish a, a process of doing sound healing where you are first acknowledging that sacredness and then you're acknowledging the boundary, the space between. And you're seeing their boundary and you're understanding that your sound is only going to go to their boundary. And, and that is possible. And the other person feels the difference. And let me explain to you what they feel. So you can do, well, let me think of the best way to explain it. If you're being acknowledged and your boundary is being acknowledged by someone else, there is an experience of inner freedom that you feel, which means that you are equal to the person who is with you. This is a guiding principle inside of me. I learned it in my very early years of doing healing, actually it's in the first year of doing healing when all this information was flooding into me. It was a spontaneous awakening. Uh, I mean, one day I was not, I didn't know this, and the next day I knew what I never imagined I would know. Nor did I imagine I would have the resource to be able to tap in to whatever it was that was showing me what I needed to know. So I was in a very um, innocent learning place during this time and I was alone. So I had a tremendous amount of uh, time. I had had a very severe accident, I had gotten a small insurance and it gave me time to not have to work. And uh, it was a real blessing. And during a ceremony that I was doing for someone else, that was a ceremony I never imagined I would do. I went into prayer and she said, I've gone into prayer. You're the one to do it. And I said, I've never done anything like this. She said, well, go pray about it. <laughs> so I pray about it and I get this very clear yes that I need to do this ceremony. And so I'm preparing for it. And it's a long preparation, very shamanic, long preparation, the things I have to do. And in the process, I am sitting um, and, uh, in this preparation and a force comes into the room. And uh, David, it was, it was not the same as Kuan Yin coming in because it, it had a male presence. I called it the law. Um, it's the only way I could describe with any kind of a name to it because it felt like the law of the universe entered the room and uh, it came into the top of my head and I felt this 
going back and forth through my cells, but it hurt. Uh, there was this, it was raw. It was a raw, irritating, um, it was almost like rubbing sandpaper on your skin. It hurt. And so I said right away, I said, I understand you're cleansing me for this ceremony. I, I get that. Could you do it without hurting me? And the presence left the top of my head. There was a pause and the presence came back into me and there was, it was, it was completely at ease. There was this grace inside of me. And what I felt, I still felt, ch -ch 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 -ch, but there was no irritation. And it was like all my cells were being cleansed. And I was being given this law. And the law is, no one is greater than or lesser than anyone else. And it, it, was, uh, it was just, it was in my body. It was everywhere in my body. It was in, it was in the tiniest of molecules in my body. And it was, I was imprinted with it. I, I will never be without it. And so that also influenced my sound healing work, which was everyone must be equal. That space inside of them, even though they feel so whatever, could be wounded, could be compacted, could be in pain, could be... Um, could be suffering from an injury, uh, could be holding a grudge. You know, there are so many things going on inside that body on all the levels of emotional, physical, spiritual, mental, and etheric. It's, it's so much going on. Um, I had to see all that as sacred and equal to me. And so there could not be an equality. There had to be a truthfulness that we are both sacred. And so I see them as sacred, completely whole, because actually we are all completely whole underneath everything that we're working with in this lifetime. So we see as whole is a reality. Doesn't mean I'm going to heal them by seeing them as whole. It means I'm going to see them as whole. And I trust the universe will do something with that. And I trust the universe uh, will help that person that I'm seeing as whole to do something with that if that's the right timing for them. So I see them as whole. And then I start working with sound in a way to diagnose them. I work with sound to respond to, because I remember I've had all those years of listening. So now I'm learning how to listen to the silence before the sound is made so that I can make the sound that they need. And that is, um, that, that is the key, is, is learning that wisdom of listening and then taking the sound to their boundary. And I don't take it into their body. I don't. I have no, per I have no business in their body when I'm working with a sound healing. Now, if I'm doing other kinds of healing, we can talk about that too. There are other times where I am in someone's body. And that is a permission situation where I have been asked to do something very specific. But in sound healing, because sound is so permeable, I don't do any of that. I don't direct sound anywhere inside the body. What I do is I give sound to the boundary. Now, here's when the remarkable thing happens. I can give sound to someone's shoulder boundary and they will feel it in their kidney. That's because they are being treated as a whole. And because they are whole inside their boundary, their whole being can take that sound and use it however they, however they want however it serves them best. And that's, that's the key to really understanding that boundary is a part of grace. It's a part of grace. It's not separate from grace. It is grace. You, you, you have an energy system that is inside your body and it's also outside your body. Many people see the auras, they see the auric fields. Many people do auric readings 
in order to understand what's going on inside the body. You know, even my acupuncturist, she, she knows, she, well, she knows me well. <laughs> so she actually doesn't give me needles. Um, we, do, we do other things, but um, we understand this energy system, which is inside your body and outside your body. So if I'm giving sound to a boundary that's, you know, could be eight inches away, could be 10. Some people who are highly, highly, vulnerable. Uh, I can be a foot away, two feet away, three feet away. I can be across the room and still do sound to them if that's what they need, because their system is so highly super sensitive and so expanded for protection. Now, in those cases, I am pulling my boundary very close to me so that I am very, very tight to my skin so that they are not feeling any threat from me at all. And in fact, what, they, what is important for them to feel is that there is space between us. And that space between us is grace too. So when we're working with the energy system and we're working inside and outside the energy system, if we are using sound and we can take that sound to the boundary of them. We are gifting them with the possibility that they can use it in the way that serves them best. Now you'll, you're hearing this from me. I have my intention is to serve them to their boundary. That is my intention. I do not have an intention that specific sounds are going to help them. I might know that from my experience. I might know that from, you know, the file cabinets in the sky. I might have that wisdom and knowledge. I choose to mostly let that stay aside. Sometimes I will use it. Sometimes I'll see a particular energetic pattern that will arise and reveal itself that uh, calls out to me because I know how to read it, you know? So I'm not only a sound healer, I'm all the things that I am when I'm also giving sound. So sometimes a client, their soul, their energy system will recognize that and they'll ask, they'll ask for something more. But I would not say that's a sound healing. I would say that's coming to Lisa for what Lisa can offer. Um, in all my classes, I, I, uh, when I teach about boundary or I teach about sound as a permeable force, I'm very clear with them that I have very specific ways of thinking about that in addition to the work that I am teaching in the class. One of my classes called The Sword um, which is in my five worlds program. It deals specifically with boundary and your energy system and how you occupy yourself with strength. Now just think about this, how you occupy yourself with strength. We're not imposing strength. How are we, how are we being strength? You know, and um, uh, cloud, uh, the, course that I'm just teaching this weekend, which is called the cloud, which is how are we being in relationship with spirit? You know, it's the being sense. It's the, it's the knowledge that we are integrated into the whole and we are still uniquely ourselves. You know, it's the great koan. It's the great paradigm that we are a part of the whole and yet we are uniquely our own universe. And so working with sound, I bring that awareness to that person that I'm working on. Hi, David. I don't hear you. Yeah, I was going to, that was like my main question. It's a, that you're just addressing right now. And it's really a question I had for years, actually, of the um, difference between being one with the universe, letting God take care of everything, right? And really just, just deferring to 
to source versus being in your power and and really manifesting what you want in your life. And it was interesting. I, I finally asked the rabbi who taught for us for a while, who just passed away last year, and he said, the main thing is you're in your power over your lower self. Whereas you, when you connect to spirit, it's there's nothing to control at all. And it's that that duality that's really interesting and very difficult because it's like you have to live in both worlds at the same time, right? You want to be connected to the flow and connected to sources flow and it's almost like there's no boundaries in a way to source. No? But So so think about, think about this slightly differently. Okay. So in in Kabbalah, uh the belief is it's a fractal belief. So um, within each spherot is the whole, within, which then, within everything mm -hmm. is the whole. Mm -hmm. So um, the, way, the way it's taught there is there was a tzimtzum, a breaking of God, and God falls into all these pieces, which are called klipo, and we are all these pieces. And when we arise back into reuniting with God, we will bring wholeness to the world. It's called tikkun olam. And it's what motivates us to be good people, right? Uh -huh. Well, that's a quality of truth that we live with inside of our body. So it's not separate. It's not an idea. Uh -huh. it's, it's relationship. So if I am in relationship to myself and spirit, if I'm in relationship, there is no contradiction. Uh -huh. There is no separation. Because... I am in the flow of the flows, S, mm -hmm. of the flows, S, flows. So I'm in my own flow. I'm in the flows of the flows of the flows because it's a fractal system. We're inside, inside, inside. And we are also in a multidimensional universe experience of all these different dimensions that are all simultaneously happening. So, so if I'm in an altered, altered, I'll call it altered space, which means I've left this dimensional reality and now I'm in my more psychic dimensional reality. I mean, you've seen me do this. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not separate from myself. I'm not different from myself. Right. I'm utilizing a different tool that's within myself. So we, if when you're in that zone... Often, I mean, there's so many different descriptions and ways to describe it. I just think call it oneness when you're in the zone of oneness. Okay. It's interesting to have to be able to be aware of boundaries at the same time, especially if there's people that are over, uh, over uh, uh, going too far with boundaries, right? So you've got to be in two worlds, right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, uh, let, me, let, me, let me give you another thought. Okay. So, so again, that's, that's a dual world. And as soon as you move to a dual world, one is greater than or lesser than. Uh -huh. so, so let's not be in the dual world. Let's be in the unified field. Uh -huh. In the unified field, my boundary is intact. In the, okay. Just imagine this. In the unified field, my boundary is intact, which means no matter what anybody else is doing, my boundary is, is intact. Mm -hmm. So... And I know this because I feel the truth of my body. Uh -huh. cool. So if, if, you, if you do practices with your body and the earth, mm -hmm. um, if, you, if you do relationship of gravity or magnetism with yourself and the earth, if you deepen that relationship of being able to tolerate the wounds in your body by being more in your body, mm -hmm that will organically give you that, um, um, that strength. It's like connecting to earth and sky at the same time, you know, yeah. which is really, but it's not even earth and sky, it's earth and sky and everything in between, including all chakras and all levels of being. It's you. Yeah. <laughs> it's in it's you. And it's you. <laughs> and it's you. And it's you. So the way I like to believe it, David, is that everyone is their own universe. Uh -huh. 
And uh, I actually saw a physicist like 30 years ago um, describe it that way. And I went, yes, yes, that's how I believe. <laughs> um, because you are, univ it depends upon your intention also on how much you want to be a part feeling wise of that which is going on around you. Mm -hmm. So if, if, as I was describing earlier about wounded children who sense, you know, through psychic space to be safe, mm -hmm. that sensing through psychic space makes you porous. Mm -hmm. Tell if me more, what does is, what is sensing through psychic space mean? It means that I am looking to see where danger is coming. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I'm looking to protect myself. I see. I was wounded as a child, and so I need to protect myself, so I send out feelers uh -huh. out there around me. Is it okay? Is it okay? Is it okay? Well, right. if you're doing that, you make yourself porous. Got it. So then you are less than what's going on around you. I have to tell you, uh, your class years ago changed my life. I mean, I could not go to a party. In fact, I hated parties because I was pulled so every which way. Right. And after your class, I went to a party and now it's, it's, it's every time I go I'm around anybody or especially a bunch of people, I'm able to pull in my field and not be affected by all everyone in the party. And it changed my life dramatically. There's another thing that's really interesting. Um, when I go and do a, a sound healing session, I don't normally take on people's energy. Right, and I'm aware of boundaries. I mean, but even even before, it's like there's something about being grounded in my own frequency. Right. Right. And yeah. And so I, so it's it's because I know so many people. I mean, psychotherapists. Yeah. It's like, oh my God, I'm wiped out from you know all the people's stuff today. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's like, and it's really. So it's it's in, it's so I think of all the different ways. One is seeing the boundary. One is being whole i mean what would what what would you say are the a few best techniques for people to immediately ground and be in their own field and not take on stuff well first you feel your feet cool cool that's the cool. first thing you mm -hmm. feel your feet you acknowledge you have feet you feel that you know your feet are on the earth <laughs> but forget it's really it. important uh, it's very easy to forget feel gravity yeah, it was funny when I was in it was in Egypt on on the Nile on about somebody did a, a workshop on grounding and I finally got it. It was like feeling gravity in my body, pulling me to the mm -hmm. center of the earth, right? Feeling the base of the spine, feet, great, great. Okay, okay. Yep. Then you feel your belly. Oh, uh huh. So you start uh -huh. with your feet and then you feel your belly. Uh huh. And you recognize your because your your purpose is all aligned to this middle part of your body. And so whether, whether what, whatever you want to, when we're digesting things, <laughs> when we are, when we're processing things, this is all the middle part of our body. Uh -huh. And so feel your belly uh -huh. and relax your belly and make friends with your belly. I have this uh, class, you know, in my classes, I teach hello hands. I teach you how to, how to use your hands to heal yourself. So, so, but you can just do it by, by being kind with your hands. And letting your hands touch your belly and be kind just be kind right. Right. then feel your face mm. because your face is how you identify with yourself it's it's what you put out into the world so if you feel your feet and then you feel your belly and then you feel your face and then let let that energy go down your back mm. let it go down your back so just do that for a minute mm -hmm. see how that feels start right. with your feet even more in your feet. Right. Mm -hmm. So let your feet say hello to the earth. Mm -hmm. Good. And don't, 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 don't attach them to the earth. You're being mm -hmm. a little strong. Don't uh -huh. attach them to the earth. Just know that that connection is real. Cool. So let me watch that. Just know your connection is, that's good. So you know your connection is real. Now you know you have feet. Now feel your belly. Mm -hmm. And you're adding your belly and notice that your belly has a lot of stuff going on because mm -hmm. you've got a lot you're processing and a lot that you're managing so relax the belly and keep your feet 
Mm-hmm. You got to do both. Oh, that's good. That's good, David. Now feel your face mm-hmm. and the joy in your face. <laughs> and the joy in your face. And now you can add your heart in, the joy in your heart, but don't let your feet up. (laughs) Don't let your feet get up. Keep Uh your feet down. Oh, that's good. Can you feel that alignment happening? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and then you let it just go down your back. Cool. And notice how that feels. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. Do you feel like you have to worry about your boundary? No. No, because you're in your body. You're home. Nice. nice. Right. The so other a... things you can do is you can use your hands magnetically. Mm-hmm. You can let your you can let your hand start to to magnetize to yourself. You can you can feel the magnety that mag, uh, magnification of energy from your hands, because sometimes people are not as developed as you. They don't have as quick a way to visualize, or mm-hmm. you know you've spent many years learning how to feel your body. Mm-hmm. Some people have a harder time. So sometimes you need to actually feel your body to make sure you know you're in it. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. Cool. We've only got a, a few minutes. Um, anything you'd like to, to say to, to sum up? Wow, thank you. Um, well, um, Yeah, there's a couple of things I just want to share. Um, You know, my work with babies, uh, which is really about uh, my work with Safe in the Arms of Love, which is really about um, recognizing and proving that that connection between mothers and babies exists energetically, Mm -hmm. um, which I have used so far for music to help calm the nervous system of of the mother and calm the nervous system of the baby because the mother's holding the baby, but the baby isn't hearing the music, only the mother is. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to take that one step further. I know you're working with babies, but I think it would be really interesting to work with a uh, boundary with babies and the recognition of their wholeness mm-hmm. with using sound. Mm-hmm. I think that's something we should talk about that could mm-hmm. be really interesting. Um, and, uh, you know, I have a play that's been produced twice, which is about birth. Mm-hmm. And as we're talking, uh, Gary and I are in a rewrite, and I'm thinking, where would Boundary belong in that play? Mm-hmm. Wouldn't that be interesting to bring mm-hmm. in? It's in my classes. You know, if anybody's interested, go to lisarafel.com and see about my Five Worlds classes, which are mm-hmm. starting. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know um, there are enough descriptions that maybe that will be helpful unto itself. Um, but I'm, I, I want people to contact me if they have questions, certainly, um, cool. you know, if they're interested. Um, and, you know, we were going to talk about uh, CDs and music at some Yeah, what point. CDs you're offering? So I have one CD called Ancient Prayers of Aaliyah, mm-hmm. which is a healing of the body. It was right after I got back from Egypt, and we went into the recording studio <laughs> We laid it down because they were like pushing out of me. This had to happen. And, um, and then we tested it on people for a year to see if it was really true. And so that was why I put that out. Then I have Soul Songs of the Labyrinth, which is, uh, was recorded in Grace Cathedral as people mm-hmm. walk the labyrinth. Oh, nice. And it's a journey into your heart and out again. Mm-hmm. And then uh, there's Space Time Phenomena which uh, is a series, a compilation from, I did nine years of concerts, sacred concerts, Mm -hmm. which includes poetry and prayers. And uh, Stephen Kent plays didgeridoo and all kinds of percussion. And uh, the late Jeffrey Gordon, um, who I really miss, wonderful percussionist, Mm -hmm. uh, was on that. Mm -hmm. And, um, And Safe in the Arms of Love, which is a book CD set, and the music will be available. Mm -hmm. It's their, their songs to really bond between mothers and babies. And actually, we got a lot of feedback from bloggers saying it was uh, impacting the whole family, Mm -hmm. that when they put the music on, they thought they were going to put the baby to sleep, but then the older child would come in and they would hug the mother. And Mm -hmm. it's because we used, um, I used all the sound healing principles in that particular CD of Mm -hmm. uh, tempo, intention, pitch, um, you know, 
something else, rhythm, and, uh, and, and created an entraining experience with these beautiful lullabies that Gary Malkin produced and arranged and created music with. So um, I'm very proud of that project with him. Cool. So, cool. so yes, there's all that. Cool. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I really appreciate you, you coming and sharing your wisdom. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for the work that you're doing, really, David. Um, you know, there are very few people who have had the focus and determination that you have had in this field to really take it to the level that you are taking it to. And, um, and at the same time, helping so many people to learn uh, how they can not only help themselves, but help each other. And... Um, you know, that's, that's really extraordinary work you're doing. And um, I really am grateful uh, to be able to teach your students who I find just wondrous. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So if yeah. anybody wants to call me, you, you uh, email me. Don't call. Uh-huh. Don't call. I, I'm in a writing phase. So email me uh, cool. <laughs> and, I will, and I will respond. Thank okay. you. Okay. okay. Take care. I'm going to play the closing video now. <laughs>